Welcome back to ECMATH. Now, today we're going to finish graphing our secant and cosecant graphs by doing some examples of transformations. Uh, so the generalized form for a secant or cosecant graph is the same as the generalized form for a normal trig graph. I did secant here, but this is, would also be true for cosecant uh, of all of these things. And so let's run through just as a matter of review what the different items do. So A uh, is an amplitude change. Um, secant and cosecant graphs don't really have an amplitude. The inner function certainly has an amplitude, which affects the thing. Um, so you can also think about this as a vertical stretch or shrink if it's less than, if the uh, coefficient there is less than one. It would be, would be a shrink. Uh, the B value, this is going to affect the period. To find the period of a graph, uh, it's going to be the same as sine or cosine. The base period is 2 pi, so to find the period, you do 2 pi divided by that b value. Um, and that's just going to change the period of the inner inside sine and cosine graph, which will then change the period of the secant or cosecant graph. What does the c value do? That's going to be your phase shift. That's what moves you to the left or right. And remember what's really important is that when you have bx plus c, your phase shift and period change often work together to create surprising transformations. So uh, we'll do some examples at the very end of that, but it actually is going to come again back to graphing sine and cosine really well. Um, and then finally, graph uh, the D component is going to be a vertical shift up or down. And it you can also think about it as changing the midline of that parent inside a uh, sine or cosine graph. And again, you know, you could maybe think about secant graphs as having a midline, but they don't really have a midline in the same way that a sine or cosine graph has a midline. Um, but you could still think about it as that kind of shift. So those are our four basic transformations um, based on the parent graphs. Let's go ahead and do some examples. Uh, so we're going to graph two cosecant of 4x. Right away, I can see that the amplitude of the inside function is going to be two. Uh, and I can also see that the period of the whole graph will be 2 pi divided by 4, which is going to reduce down to pi over 2. That's interesting. That's going to be a very short period. So when I scale out my axis, I am going to give myself more space than I usually would. I am going to set, uh, I usually do about 4 squares to be pi, but I'm going to let 8 squares be pi. So 4 squares can be pi over 2. I can still have 0 there. and negative pi can live over there. Now what I'm going to do is graph a, let's see, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So I'm going to graph a sine graph with a period of pi over 2 and an amplitude of 2. Once I've kind of graphed one little copy of the wave, I can either continue the wave or if I want to keep my graph tidy, I can just can copy the key points from the pattern. Copying the key points from the pattern is usually enough. Although something seems to have gone wrong. Uh, stare at anything long enough, you'll find out the mistake. And the mistake was Mr. X can't count to four. There's pi, uh, four spaces along. And we'll carry out the pattern backwards as well. Okay. Now, every time that I plotted a zero or my curve had a zero, I'm going to give myself a little more curve here. Every time I plotted a zero or that sine curve was at zero, then I'm going to need to have a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to draw all of those in right here in red. There is one at zero. And every sp every time the uh, inside function was graphed at plus or minus two, not one, but two because of the amplitude change, I know that the cosecant would also have that same reciprocal value because it would end up being two over two. Or, um, yeah, two over two. 
And with those key points, I know enough to do the graph. So I just fit a graph nicely between the asymptotes. This graph never crosses the uh, x-axis. The only way you're going to get a cosecant graph to cross the x-axis is with a vertical shift up or down. Kind of being a little extra here, filling the page with more graphs than I need. Um, this is one, two, three, four, four full periods of this uh, cosecant graph, just because that's what I had space for. So that's the first example. Next example, here's that vertical shift I was talking about, y equals secant of x minus 1. And usually vertical shifts are kind of the easiest graph you're ever going to graph with uh, sine, cosine, and trig stuff, but actually gets a little messy with these uh, secant graphs. So let's go ahead and take this apart. Secant of x is 1 over cosine of x. So I'm going to graph an inside cosine graph, but I'm also going to do a shift down one unit as I do it. So I'll go ahead and scale up my axis. Now I'm going to use my regular scale, go to 2 pi, pi, negative pi. And I'm going to plot a new midline at negative 1. Just like as if I was graphing, so I'm effectively going to graph cosine of x minus 1. And see where I go from there. So cosine, oops. Cosine starts at its max value, goes to its min value, and then goes back up. So cosine should look like this. Something like that. Now I'm going to go cross uh, draw the vertical asymptotes. You might be tempted, because you've been paying attention, to draw the vertical asymptotes where my green graph touches the x-axis. That would be wrong though. Um, what we really should have done is drawn the secant graph, which would look like uh, this, and then take that graph and move the whole graph down one. We're kind of doing that in a cheating order because it's easier to draw the inside function first, but since I moved the inside function down, what I really need to think about are the values where the inside function crosses its midline. And those are going to be the values of the vertical asymptote. So in this case, it's going to happen on the pi over 2s. So I'll draw the asymptotes here. And then we'll connect and create the graph from the max and min of the inside function. Still respecting those asymptotes. I'll do a second period out here, kind of respecting the shape. So that would be our graph of y equals secant of x minus 1. It's a vertical shift downwards. The only thing you have to pay attention with those is don't get too excited about the x-axis. You're basically done with it after you shift down. Um, and draw your asymptotes where your inside graph catches the midline. Now what you've all been waiting for a graph, and we're going to do two of these, with a period change and a phase shift. These are always the things that uh, get people the, the hardest, so we're going to uh, kind of really take our time with this. Now I'm looking at the cosecant function, and to really understand this, I need to really understand the parent graph of cosecant, so I'm going to scroll back up to that really quick. This is the cosecant graph from the other video, and what I really want to remember from this is that it's the reciprocal of sine, so it has asymptotes where sine is 0, which is going to happen at 0, pi, and 2 pi. 0, pi, and 2 pi. So those asymptotes have undergone, uh, in this function, a period change and a phase shift, which means they've then shifted left and right and then also squished around. That's going to make them really hard to locate. But we have this nice trick that we use for sine and cosine graphs, and we're going to and tangent graphs, and we're going to use it again here. If I write down where the asymptotes of the parent are happening at, uh, 0 pi and 2 pi, what you can do is set the argument equal to these three values and solve. So I'm going to do that here.
Now, I probably didn't have to solve for all three of these asymptotes. I probably could have just found two asymptotes and then worked from there. But, you know, for the purpose of this video, it didn't really take much longer. And that's told me now where the base period of this graph is going to start and how the spacing should be. So it seems like the asymptotes happen every 2 pi apart. Let's double check that. The period should be 2 pi over b or 4 pi. Well, the total distance from the start of a period to the end of a period is 2 2 pi spaces or 4 pi. So our solving algebra here agrees with what we know about the period being 2 pi over b. Uh, so based on that, now I'm just going to pick some values. I'm just going to scale my axis as pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi. I know that the first asymptote should have happened at 2 pi. So I'm going to draw it here. Next asymptote seems to happen at 4 pi, so I'll draw that there. Next at 6 pi. And I can also kind of pick up the spacing on the asymptotes now, that it's going to be uh, 2 pi apart, so I'm going to just continue the spacing. It's every On this graph, it's every 2 squares. And I'm going to draw the inside function. Cosecant is 1 over sine x. So sine x would look, uh, I've been doing green for that, would look like this. Going from 2 pi to 6 pi, that's the starting and end, and then there's that asymptote in the middle. Then I'll take that function, draw the min and max. There's the max, and curving up. Actually, I guess that's a minimum. It's the maximum of the sine graph, it's the minimum of the cosecant graph. Here's the min of the sine and the max, local max, of the cosecant graph. And then I'm just going to continue the pattern because I now see what the pattern is. So we'll do down like this up like this, down like this, do one more up like this. We have one, two, three, uh, three full periods of this graph now graphed out nicely. And you can see how it's kind of also appears like a shrink and a reflection of a cosecant because we've shifted it so far over that it starts to appear like a reflection of the parent graph. And that's one thing that can happen with these graphs is you can have multiple uh, different sets of transformations that cause you to arrive in the same location. Um, also, I guess I should scale my y-axis uh, 1 and negative 1 because there's no vertical transformations going on. It's all the transformations here were on the x-axis. If you look very carefully to my side right now, you'll notice my cat. That's Pepper. She uh, thinks she's the Lion King and is also extra grumpy because we just changed her food and she thinks she should have more of this fresh kibble in the bowl. Uh, that is all. We uh, are now going to look at my last graph, secant of pi x minus pi. So secant is 1 over cosine x. Here again I'm looking at a period change and a phase shift. So just like before, I'm going to go back and look at my parent graph for secant and figure out where the asymptotes are. Looking at the parent graph of secant, I notice that the asymptotes happen on the pi over 2s. In the previous problem, I picked up three asymptotes, and I kind of remarked that I didn't really need all three asymptotes. This one's sufficiently annoying that I'm only really going to pay attention to these middle two asymptotes and kind of center myself around zero, pick up that spacing. Notice that in between those asymptotes, I have like a vertical... Uh, upwards facing u. Um, and so then I will be able to fi figure out and piece together the rest of the graph from there, just based on the asymptotes at plus and minus pi over 2. Okay, so back to our problem here. Uh, I wrote down where the two asymptotes I wanted to grab from the parent are. Now I'm going to set the argument here equal to both of those terms. So that's very interesting. You'll notice here that the um, x values canceled out, or the, sorry, the, the pi values canceled out. That doesn't mean this one half is not in radians. We've seen this before. It happens whenever you have a pi on the x. It means that your graph is going to be scaled not on the pi values. It's just going to be scaled on integer values. They're still radians. They just happen to be integer radians, not pi radians.
So it looks like I have asymptotes on the one half markers. So I guess I'm going to scale my axis uh, so I have two squares to work with. I'm going to plot out those two vertical asymptotes. I'm going to scale my y-axis in the same way, 1 and negative 1 being two squares each. And then what I noticed in the parent was that that matched with the upward connecting loop of cosine. So if I were to continue the pattern, the downward connecting loop of cosine would have to do this. And I would have to have another asymptote here. So I'm having asymptotes every one. Even though it's spaced a little funnily, my asymptotes are happening every one. And then I'm graphing the reciprocal function. So once I've graphed at least a little bit of the inside function, I can start to pick up the pattern and connect the pieces. That's one period two periods. No, that's two periods. And I'll go ahead and draw a third because I have space. And there's my third. So that's three periods of secant pi x minus pi. That was the last example I was going to share with you today. I would encourage you guys, especially if you're working from home and trying to learn this uh, independently at home, to get yourself on Desmos. Go on desmos.com forward slash calculator, type in one of these graphs, and then start playing with sliders. Um, you can also graph both the inside and outside functions at the same time and kind of see how those always relate. I think especially those sliders help when you're doing those phase changes and shifts and stretches just to help wrap your brain around like what exactly is happening when you do a shift and when you do a stretch and how they interact together because it can be confusing. Uh, but it does get better with practice. So uh, that's been our graphs of sine and cosine. Please email me as always with your questions, uh, post them to our classroom, and I will see you guys next time.